Hello, everyone. Welcome to Arash's World. Today, we have a very special guest on Arash's World, and he's going to talk about very interesting ideas. Welcome to Arash's World, uh, Rabbi Jeffrey Katz. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Great. Thank you so much. So um, how would you briefly uh, describe yourself and introduce yourself to our audience? What would you talk about? What would you focus on any way you see fit? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm rarely asked that question. I'd like to think that um, I, I'm a seeker of truth, I guess, at the end of the day. And part of, and part of that truth is how we can best live life and live life to, um, to its fullest with the most meaning and, um, you know, really, really get up in the morning and look forward to the day because you're involved in all kinds of positive activities, whether it's with your family or your link to God, your career, your business, um, improving your character, and, uh, you know, just doing all the things that make us human and that we want to feel good about ourselves. In. Oh, that's how I would describe myself. That's even better. Oh, terrific. Than that. That's wonderful. That's great. And so your, your, your book is, um, your latest book is Rules to Live By, Maimonides, uh, Guide to a Wonderful Life. And mm -hmm. so um, we have your rules, living, life, wonderful. That's a word I, I love and I use a lot. But who is Maimonides? Yeah, it's a great question. Maimonides um, lived about 800 years ago. You know, um, his, his works, he was a man of unbelievable, diverse talents and genius. He was the top doctor of his time. He was you know, basically the king, uh, the, the personal doctor, the king of Egypt, who at that time was the um, sultan in Cairo. He um, also was the greatest legalist and jurist of his time, if you can believe it. And above everything else, he was one of the greatest spiritualists and people who focused on God and a connection to God in the Western world almost more than anybody else. And as a result of his multi-layered genius, his works are still studied today. I mean, in every major university, they're still grappling with the um, ideas of Maimonides. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas took a lot of Maimonides' ideas in his work. Um, and um, in, the, in the Jewish schools all, across, all over the world, they're pouring over Maimonides' work. So he's someone who has stood the test of time. And, you know, when I stumbled on his thinking when I was just a teenager, you know, um, when I was in college many years ago. <laughs> so when I was in college, I was once, uh, I went home for Passover and my father left me a, just a book on the coffee table. Of course, he didn't tell me to read it. He was too smart for that. He just left it lying around and I picked it up and it was a book about Maimonides thinking. When I saw some of the ideas of Maimonides, I knew I was home. I knew I was with somebody who would guide me and just give me such basic common sense principles for living, which, you know, when you follow them, they're so basic and they're so they're so profound and they're so right that they really do lead to just success and contentment, you know, really in all the major areas of life. You know, it's interesting because Maimonides himself had a very, very hard life, even though when the dust settled at the end, you know, he was terrific and everything. But the first half of his life, he was born in Spain. And the when he was just a young boy, the Almohads, who were uh, a fanatical Islamic sect, took over Spain. And they basically chased him and his family and many other similar people out of the country on the pain of death or conversion. So my mom and he spent the first half of his life basically just running away from persecutors and, you know, sleeping in forests and being on boats all night trying to escape people. He would even write, you know, I'm writing this commentary here. Please excuse me if I don't have all the punctuation exactly correct. But I happen to be in a boat, you know, and they're being chased. I'm not riding under the optimal writing conditions. So he really was incredible. But when the dust cleared, he gave us these transformational rules for living in all the different areas of life. Again, it's it's not like they're forced on us. They're so they're so pleasing to hear and understand because once once they're absorbed and understood, they're really the keys to um, fulfillment and happiness. And and I was so happy 
that I had the opportunity to write a book in each of the main areas of life. And I've distilled Maimonides' most practical ideas for living in, in every area, finances and career, family life, spirituality and connection to God, um, health. You know, he was the top doctor of, of, of his age, after all. Um, and, and you know, all, all the things that people need for good living. And I was so happy I was able to make it all so simple. You know, the chapters in my book are only two or three pages long. Typically, each chapter focuses on one main basic idea of Maimonides that can very easily be implemented by anybody and turn anyone's life around. Yeah, and I want to get to that in a moment, but just that, that life that he had was, was fascinating. And he didn't want to convert to Islam, which would have uh, solved a lot of issues, but he stood true to it. He was authentic. He's an authentic, authentic person. And it's like, well, that's not what I believe in. And what I find fascinating, though, is that Islamic scholars have studied him, too, and so did Christians. And so he influenced, yeah. as you say, Thomas Aquinas, who is uh, a very imposing figure. And he yeah. was he himself was influenced by Arist Aristotle. So that's also mm -hmm. the connection with mm -hmm. him for the ancient Greeks, but I'm kind of worried that I did not hear about him before until until now. And I'm somebody who loves philosophy and I, I study it. Yeah. And I'm wondering why did his name not come up? Because he was a very important person back in his day and continues to be, as you're saying, taught at different universities, just not at my university where mm -hmm. I was. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic question, and I'll answer it in a minute, but it's 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 wild to note that Maimonides is the only post-biblical figure to be celebrated and even revered by all three major Western religions. Like you said, Judaism, of course, Christianity, because he, uh, Thomas Aquinas was kind of Maimonides' heir and did um, the same exercise and picked up for Christianity where Maimonides had left off Judaism and Islam. He's, he was a, a celebrated intellectual among in, in all the Islamic community of his age. So he really combined all of that. And he also, Maimonides felt also that he would be, that if he wouldn't write down his legacy, and that's almost a part of it because the writings are so voluminous, that's really the trick a little bit and why it's hard sometimes to get into it because what I've done is I've distilled so much from so much information, all the practical ideas, you know, the writings are very, are, are voluminous, but he felt that if he would not write everything down, that he would ultimately be denying people their rightful inheritance. Mm -hmm. He felt that he had to put all his knowledge down in all these different areas because again, he felt that he had come to understand certain things that he knew that were of such great value to everybody, including down to us, that he just felt he had to put it all down and otherwise it would be denying us our rightful inheritance. But the drawback of that was that the writings are so voluminous that it's hard to go through. I mean, just the medical treatises are thousands and thousands of pages. The rules of living are, are equally voluminous, but the ideas are profound and of great effect. And that's what I've summarized in the book. And that's why I'm so delighted that I have been able to be part of this chain of passing down these rules to live by. Because again, the book breaks it down, rules to live by, you know, Maimonides' Guide to a Wonderful Life, breaks down into seven basic areas of life. All of the main principles of Maimonides for everyday living and the practical genius. And the chapters, again, are vignettes they're bite size, you know, you can put it by your bed and read two or three chapters before you go to sleep and so forth. So that's what I was very humbled and delighted to be a part of. And I want to look at that. There are a lot of them, they sound so modern. So it's it's kind of fascinating. And somebody 800 years ago wrote that, but they're also timeless because at any point of time, we can benefit from it. So that makes it also so so outstanding. And so uh, I'm just mentioning some of the maxims that uh, I was looking through. It's in finance, mm -hmm. where it says, be strict with yourself and generous with others. And I find that fascinating. And let's elaborate a bit on that because uh, again, that's a very yeah. interesting idea. Yeah, um, because... Yeah, and you could understand that in two ways. Like in finances, be strict with yourself, but generous with others. So in terms of a family and family life, you know, if you're running a family and you have you happen to be a little short on money, the proper and appropriate thing to do, Maimonides tells us, is 
skimp with yourself first. Mm. Be strict with yourself. Be only skimp with your spouse or with your children after you've skimped with yourself everything you can cut back from yourself. That That's the appropriate way to do it on a personal level in family life. And on a larger scale in like commercial life, what Maimonides is teaching us is that if you're um, if you're handling someone else's money, you have to be strict and scrupulous to the penny with other people's money. But when other people are handling your own money, Maimonides is saying, don't be so scrupulous. Don't be so crazy to the penny. Be more relaxed. But when you're holding other people's money, that's when you have to be absolutely scrupulous and, and, and unforgiving. That's the idea of politicians, they're using our money and they're not uh, following that Isn't advice. It? So I'm worried about yeah. that. <laughs> you know, one, one response I often get is when people read the book, they say, every politician in the country should be forced to read this book before they take office. Since it's a little bit, you know, other things like Maimonides has other famous maxims or, or, or very important maxims. Like, for example, he says, be willing to lose with truth and right rather than gain with falsehood and wrong. And there's so much, there's so much wisdom in that yeah. because, you know, if, if someone tricks you or fools you, you know, maybe they'll have a short term gain. Maybe they got the $50 or off you or whatever, but does that really hold them in, in good stead in the long term when people know that they're tricksters and, and they're not, you know, trustworthy people that doesn't, it, it hurts them so much in the long term. So it just pays like establishing your character in this way is so important. I mean, there's also like related ideas. If, if people could just do like may, the basic qualities of character, if people can just develop them themselves, like Maimonides also said um, that the risk of a wrong decision is preferable to the terror of indecision. He's pointing to how important it is to be able to be to make decisions in life, to have success in all areas of life, people need to become comfortable making decisions. Now, we're all human. And of course, we can make from time to time, we make poor decisions. And sometimes our decisions will be wrong. But you have to be able to make decisions. And you also have to be comfortable making decisions for other people when it's appropriate to do that, like for members of your family and so forth, for children or others. Now, if one develops those basic qualities of character, like um, he's trustworthy, you know, um, he's not, people know he has a great integrity and he's trustworthy. And also he knows how to make decisions and someone who um, is reliable, like if he says he's gonna do something, it gets done. I mean, how how rare are such people with those basic qualities? You think maybe a business would be interested in somebody who's reliable and trustworthy and knows how to make decisions. Once you have those basic qualities of character, and they seem so simple, but they're so rare. They're so rare. I mean, how many people have all of those three, for example, like one in 10,000 or something? And if you have those, then Maimonides teaches that even irrespective of your IQ, even, mm -hmm. or irrespective of your technical skills in any area, your career is going to skyrocket mm -hmm. because you've set yourself apart from all your peers because your word is your bond. When you say you're going to be somewhere, you're there. When you say something's going to be on somebody else's desk by 9 p.m. next Tuesday, it's there and you just, and you're trustworthy and you know how to make decisions. Even though these sound like simple rules, and they are simple, that's the trick. They're incredible. They're really secret keys to success. If you have them, you you are head and shoulders above most of you, most of your peers. And I think it's also being authentic, apart from trustworthy and reliable, and also being yourself, being authentic. And that is so much lacking. I mean, people say they're being authentic, but I, they often feel you're not, or they, they go like, as you're saying, they prefer the falsehood because it benefits them, but at the cost of losing authenticity and like what they truly believe in. And again, we come back also to politicians, and I don't want to talk about them specifically, but I think we'd like to, I'd like to put their book like on their desk and put maybe a sticky note, say, don't read this. 
And hopefully that would work. But I think that's what we need more in the world instead of always driven by your own profit or but but profits you personally, but is not necessarily what you want, what you need, what is you, what's your essence. And we're losing touch of that in, in many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's almost like the old joke. People say act sincere whether you mean it or not, uh -huh. you know, yeah. Yeah. and that's kind of where we are. And it's bad commentary that in some ways that's where we are. And, you know, what you say about kind of everything being done for profit and so forth. I mean, Maimonides really focuses on that also because, mm -hmm. you know, some people, you know, Maimonides was famous for work, for his um, work and his insights on charity. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, his highest level of charity is helping someone help himself. In other words, it was his expression, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. But even beyond that, because that, of course, is the highest level of charity where you help somebody to the degree where he will never need anyone's charity again. You know, helping someone get a job and teaching him how to be self-sufficient. That's the highest level. But even at all other levels, you know, Maimonides teaches us that most people think that you need to, like, if you're going to be philanthropic, or charitable person, oh, first you have to be wealthy for that. First you have to become very wealthy, and then you become charitable or philanthropic. Maimonides teaches just the opposite. It's by adopting a philanthropic mindset. Yes. It's by, it's, even if you're poor, by just um, adopting some cause or some value or some idea that you that animates your life and that you're going to devote some of your time and some of your energy to on a volunteer basis because it's the right thing to do and because it helps people. That is a great key. I mean, you don't do it because of this, but but when you do those things, you increase the odds tremendously that you yourself will become affluent. So it's the charitable mindset comes before the affluence in many, many cases. And, and it's not a coincidence. There are very big reasons for it. Because first of all, when you donate your time and energy, even not money, just donate your time and energy to a worthwhile, important, like local project, for example, by, because it's a volunteer, you develop in yourself, you cultivate an emotional detachment from money. Mm -hmm. You become detached emotionally from money. And that's the number one quality you need to make money. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. to make good financial decisions, you have to be emotionally removed from, mon from the money. Mm -hmm. Because it takes, it, you have to spend money to make money. If you're too emotionally attached to it, you'll never make money. Because you won't be able to make good investments. You won't be able to part with the money. It's just like a surgeon. A surgeon will never operate on his or her own child because no matter how great a surgeon they are, they're too close to the situation. They can't make good surgical decisions. So, too, if you're too emotionally tied up with your money, you just can't make good financial decisions. And charity work lets you develop that emotional detachment, that healthy emotional detachment for money that lets you make tremendous financial decisions. You know, it also... When you get involved in charitable work and philanthropic work in your community, you become a magnet for other people. I mean, everyone wants to get involved in terrific, worthwhile projects that help people and that serve underserved people. But many people, you become just a magnet for many good people. And as a result, you wind up developing very often a network of contacts and network of relationships with some very successful people and people who are already very affluent. And these people often have business opportunities and investment opportunities and job opportunities. Once you get involved in that type of charity work, it's very common that you will develop a network of people that will, um, you know, you'll be able to avail yourself of so many opportunities, social, financial, I mean, every which way up and down um, the um, spectrum that you never would have otherwise. And I mean, there are so many benefits. The last one I'll mention is if you're a young person and you get involved in such a charitable project, you know, very often it involves raising a small sum of money and then trying to accomplish something important with it. You think someone, you know, to do that, 
you need to have you need to develop budgetary skills you need to develop operational skills management skills how to bring about an effective result in a little organization with a small sum of money you think businesses might be interested in people who with a small amount of money and budgetary expertise can successfully manage projects and get things done. I mean, by doing these things, it can often bridge the gap that people have in developing basic skills that they need to really just, just excel in any job. And, and any job, someone with those kind of skills, any firm in the country will just be dying to have them. And, and their career is going to skyrocket. And again, that's not why you do the philanthropic work, but that's the result of it. And that's just the way God created the world. I love what you're saying. Completely agree with you. And I think the problem is often when it comes to charity and you have these these wealthy people giving to charity, I'm always like suspicious. Uh, there's something suspicious going on because they're trying to evade taxes or they want to look good. And it, it's again, that that lack of character often. And I think what, yeah. what I love about what you're saying is really the focus is on character, being a right. charitable person, being a generous person, being a good person and like really embodying that. And also your attitude kind of comes through as as well because it is a very positive and helpful attitude and you're not out for just making quick money or looking good because you know if you're truly yourself and you're acting from your heart people will appreciate you oh totally and that's also you know you really hit the nail on the head there because it's really these qualities of your character that one needs to develop once the person has developed those, everything else kind of fits into place, mm -hmm. including the relationship with God. And Maimonides, of course, was one of the greatest spiritual figures of all time. And Maimonides believed that just like a, a child, a small child can't be happy unless the um, child has a strong link with parents, so too no person can be happy, Maimonides says, unless he's developed a strong connection, a strong link with God. And Maimonides teaches us how to do that. It's by thinking correctly about God. You know, your, your thinking, your uh, mind is the noblest part of a person. And by thinking about the noblest entity in existence, God, with the noblest part of your body, which is your mind, that's the connection to God. And when you think about God with correct thoughts, as Maimonides teaches us, you effectively build a tunnel like a tunnel up from your mind up to God. It's a bridge or a tunnel. And the trick is that it's a two-way bridge. It's a two-way tunnel. The same bridge that you build up to God from your mind by thinking about God properly, that's the same tunnel through which God looks down on you and watches over you and watches over you. For example, divine providence will come to you through that tunnel. God may implant certain ideas in your mind to help you through a tough situation. You know, Maimonides teaches us that about the divine overflow. That's this, this overflowing abundance of wisdom and guidance and information and ideas and love that's emanating from God at all times. The trick is that we have to become like receivers to pick it up. It's like a radio. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like a radio. You know, there are these radio waves, these beams all over the place. If the radio is not tuned correctly, it's not going to pick up anything. It's like the radio waves do not even exist. So it's the same way with us. We have to kind of tune attune ourselves correctly so how do we do that again like with a radio you get rid of the static and you pick up the proper reception now how do you get rid of the static you get rid of the static again it's character related by removing all of the negativity by removing the envy removing the grudges removing the gossip removing the focusing on the bad qualities of people and it's all of that negativity which just drains your emotional power you know some people go through life just reacting their whole life is just reacting to things you know people send them emails they don't like they react nastily back they get texts they don't like they react back someone looks at them on the street the wrong way they get mad and they react if your life is just reacting all you know like that it's like your life you're like a powder keg always blowing up at these small nuisances what a sad situation for someone's beautiful emotional power and mental energies to be 
stuck that like that by all this trivial negativity. Instead, Maimonides tells us you have to work on it. Let's get rid of all that. Let's get rid of all the negativity. Let's just get the positive going in your life. Then you've freed up so much mental and emotional power. You've retaken emotional yeah. control over yeah. your day. And then you could basically do anything you want, including yeah. the values that you're going to focus on. And then once you've cleared away that static, you will then be able to receive the divine overflow to a greater degree. And then when that happens, you will see signposts in your life clearly yes. for the best directions ahead for you that you never would have seen before. And they'll be so obvious to you once you remove those roadblocks, once you get rid of all that negativity that's sucking all the energy out of you, you will clearly see very often the, the best directions for your road ahead in life. Yeah. The light is always there, and the light is 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 love and positivity and so on. That is not wishful thinking. It is there. We just don't see it, and we just block right. our eyes. And like the the image of the sun, which is always shining, but then the the clouds, it's overcast, and we assume it's not there, but it is there. And I think uh, I love the term also enlightenment because it mm -hmm. includes light in it, and I see it in both ways. That's mm -hmm. the, the the brightness, the light, but also mm -hmm. feeling light and not being dragged down, not that that heaviness that we feel. And I think that's that's really important to 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 keep in mind as we as we go through life. And the evil is the absence of light because it just takes if you turn on the light, the dark disappears in an instant. And so we have the Big Bang it was completely dark, and we say the Big Bang and the light came, and then suddenly there's light. So it's really the light we need to focus on, and not on the darkness because the darkness is just the absence of light. And I think he talks something uh, along those lines as well. Yeah. Oh, oh, he does. He yeah. does absolutely because my mind teaches that evil is really just the absence of good, mm -hmm. um, and it's just like that. Um, you know, darkness is really just the absence of light. So when we remove the negativity, when we remove the darkness, we're really left with the light. And light, as you note, is also, is also a metaphor for reasoning and rationale. And our mind is really that light. And that's our link to God. And it's also the link to so many other wonderful things in our life. Like um, one of the sections in, in my book, Rules to Live By, is in developing the best relationships with your family members. So for example, your children. Maimonides teaches us, don't become your child's boss, become your child's advisor. In other words, if you're your child's boss and you just try to you know, control your kid's life, that is not gonna get you far. And that is not gonna be healthy for the relationship because the kids will just, I mean, wind up either resenting you at best or at worst hating you you know, a parent that tries to control their life, what is the much superior approach is to um, teach your child what the likely results of his or her decisions are going to be. So when you're, if your child has a decision to make, don't make it for them and don't tell them what to do. Explain, well, if you make this decision, this is likely to happen. And if you make the other decision, another result is likely to happen. Then your kids will see you. You're like a prophet to them because obviously your life experience is so much faster than this. your predictions are usually going to come true. And then your kids will Obviously, they want the best outcomes for themselves also, usually. So they will then come to trust you and come to you with their problems as a trusted advisor. Much better than trying to control anyone's life. You know, children are, you know, a lot like trees in that regard. You know, trees obviously need to be watered. Yeah. But if you overwater a tree, it won't develop strong roots because you give it so much water, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to go deep and develop the roots and become strong. The same thing with children. If we don't teach them to make their own decisions and to have good judgment on their own, they'll never have that. And that is the saddest thing because then the kids don't know how to make their own decisions. And then once they get a little bit older and they become subject to all of the bombardment and the constant brainwashing from all kinds of sources, they're just help. They're just they're just helpless in those. Um, they're helpless in those situations. Um, you know. So, you know, we have to do everything possible in order to, um, you know, enhance 
in order to enhance um, our children's ability to make to make their own judgments. Also, when you when you have values that you work on that um, and that, you know, like we like we said before, you pick ideas that animate your life. and You get all those amazing benefits um, from not only doing the charitable work and doing the right thing, but all of the benefits that come. Those are also amazing things to focus on in your family life, because what greater way to build a strong family than to reason things out together, share values with your children. And when I say children, I also include grandchildren and nieces and nephews and really any other younger people in, 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 in your family. Um, what greater way to build a terrific, happy, strong family than by doing these projects together that you all love? It shares your values, because remember, you know, if you don't instill your own values in your children, there are other people waiting in the way, yes. <laughs> waiting yeah. to instill theirs. Yes. And, and and it comes down to also respect, because you don't want resentment from your children. When you tell them what to do, you, you they feel you feel grudges there because they begrudgingly do it. But then to earn respect, and that's something we have to work hard for. And I, I love what you're saying about my relationship with my son is too. I see him as a friend and often a teacher because what he oh. says, oh. even though it's criticism, it's often correct. And it's not because I'm the parents like, oh, no, I know better than you do. No, it doesn't work that way. If he's telling me the truth, I have to accept it. And I think that we really helps with uh, with the relationship too of really like listening to the other person respecting them and being respected in return and uh, what you're saying here is absolutely that it's not again the, the i'm the authority and you do as i as i say and a lot of psychologists say you should uh, be the parent you should not be the friend and i i disagree with that because i would see like we're the family is a unity and there, there mm -hmm. should be a certain amount of democracy there. Of course, the financial decisions I will make, not him, but mm -hmm. the other stuff that he's he's uh, contributing as well and to listen to them more. You know, my, the, absolutely right. Maimonides said, accept the truth from whatever source it comes. And if the truth happens to come from a young child, sometimes it does, that yeah. has to be respected. And, you know, in terms of respect among family, Maimonides talks a lot about that. For example, you know, it's a biblical command to respect one's parents. And Maimonides talks at length about the type of respect one should give to his parents. It even extends, he, Maimonides gives us an example. Let's say you're being, you know, there's a dinner in your honor in your community and somehow your whole community is there and you're dressed in your best clothes and you're trying to act your best and your father or mother walks up to you with a pot and just starts hitting you over the head with the pot <laughs> while simultaneously spinning in your face. Maimonides says, remain silent. Do not object. Say nothing. Even take the abuse and do not object. Because Maimonides notes that if the president of the United States or some king or prince had commanded you to stay silent in such a situation, you certainly would have. But in this case, it's not a president or, or a king or a prince who's done it, but it's the king of kings, God, who spoke and created the universe, who commands you to do this. And Maimonides says that, you know, let's say you're in a business meeting and your mother calls you and she needs you to help her out for 10 minutes. Maimonides says, don't make up an excuse. Don't say, oh, I have an errand to run for 10 minutes. I have to do Tell the people in your meeting, my mother needs me for 10 minutes. I have to break. That's my highest priority. And he says, my mind, he says, be bold about it. Let other people know how seriously you take your obligation to respect your, your parents. Because it's very important and it's appropriate that people know how important you view that obligation. And it's it's good. I mean, the, the speaking up for the truth, and that's something I, I, I like to do too, is speaking up when, when things are, are are not right and just point that out. But then also it's it's kind of relative, depending on situation. Sometimes silence might be better. And I love that kind of like you have to decide on the spur of the moment. There's not just one way of doing things. What is the situation and how do you react in that situation? So I love that to 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 respond in that context of like, well, maybe it's better you're silent in this moment. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's one of the examples. Another expression of Maimonides is that silent is the maturation of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And in that case, that's the situation. In that situation, silence shows much a higher character than any type of speech um, could ever say. Maimonides also says, 
you know, teach your tongue to say, I do not know, and you will progress. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people are often not humble. They think they know everything when they don't know anything about anything about a certain subject, for example. You know, I mean, what just comes to mind, like atheists, they say, we know there's no God. We've Uh proven it. It's Uh so preposterous. I mean, it's not even the kind of thing that could ever be proved because you can't prove a negative. I mean, if nothing else, you can't prove a negative. It's so preposterous. And I think Maimonides is so on point. You know, people who... Uh, he was right when he said that people need a relationship with God to be happy. And because that's true, you know that it's right. And, you know, there's a visceral feeling, you know, that people of faith have. And I think the feeling can also be developed, but it's something that atheists are really missing. And the the biggest thing they're missing is humility. Yes, I, I find it's very egocentric because you say, I don't believe in God, therefore he does not or it does not exist. And I'm thinking, well, who right. are you to decide? Just because you don't believe something doesn't mean that it's not real. So it's it's like, and even if we try to prove with, with reasons and so on, but what if it's beyond that? It's just, we're seeing the humans as godlike. And I think, I, I think the idea is there are higher beings than us. Why not? We're not, yeah. it's not like when we thought we were the center of the universe, we're not. And so right. the same way, humans might not be at the top of the chain as we think we are there are other and i think there are other beings that are higher and more evolved than we are why not accept and humility is really the word here that i like <laughs> so is he uh, is there a mystical element there because somebody like it reminds certain things remind me of meister eckhart for example like uh, you need to be empty for god to enter and so on is there a mystical aspect to uh maimonides there there is a mystical aspect to it very interestingly but it's kind of, it has to, I'll tell you what it is, because it's interesting. Mm-hmm. It has to do with the expression we just discussed, teach your tongue to say, I do not know, and you will progress. Because the essence of God, God is so great. I mean, just try to fathom it. All of the billions and trillions of galaxies and time and space. And, you know, even the greatest physicist, if he knows his stuff, will admit to you that 95% of what's in the universe, we have no idea what it is. We have no clue about it. What we know about the elements that we know about is only 5% of the known universe. Everything else we don't know. 95% at least, at least 95%, we know absolutely nothing about. In fact, physicists call it dark energy and dark matter just because it means unknown. We don't know anything about it. We call it dark because it's So in other words, there's so much we don't know. Of course, there's higher beings and there's other beings and there's there's room for so much. We don't even know enough to know what there's room for and what there's not room for, only because we the one thing we know enough to know, like Socrates all those years ago, is that we don't know much. And of course, so Maimonides also talks about all this and recognizes even though from from Maimonides, reason is so important, the limits of reason are also equally important. And, and, And therefore, when you speculate about God, some of the speculation is just speculating about the fact, excuse me, that the being is so great that we can't really know much about what God actually is. Because, I mean, how can it be? God knows everything. Like God's knowledge of us does not change from like when we were born and as we live. Like I know you by looking at you. I hear what you write. I hear what you say. I make judgments. God knows us not because he looks at us. God knows us. Maimonides explains this very beautifully. God knows us because he created us in accordance with his own wisdom. Therefore, God's knowledge of us is the same from before we were born, throughout our our entire lives, and after we die into eternity. God's knowledge of us does not change, because God created us in accordance with his own wisdom. He doesn't have to look at us and observe us to know. Now, we still have free will, of course, but that is not inconsistent. In fact, that's one of the secrets, perhaps, that Maimonides hints at in the um, four-letter name of God in Hebrew, the tetragrammaton, 
because in Hebrew, those translate to past, present, and future, more or less. They're a combination of the terms for past, present, and future. I mean, it's almost Einstein touched on this. Because God is beyond time, for God, from his from God's perspective, our past, present, and future are the same. They've either, it, it's meaningless to say, it's like saying what happened before the Big Bang. It's meaningless. God is outside of time. So God's not the universe. God created the universe. God's not inside of time and subject time. He's outside of it. So God is so great. He's unfathomable to us. Like, so therefore, even the positive expressions we use, we say God is great and he's terrific and he's fabulous. So is that it? <laughs> Are you finished now? Praising yeah. God. So, yeah. so, so that's just recognizing the futility of trying to fully comprehend what God is. We, but we can, and it's mystical in that sense. We can have a feeling of awe and connectedness because we can use our rationale to know some things about God, and that's what we have to do. We have to do, like always, my mind says, if we do the best we can in each area, we're going to have tremendous success. And following these rules, these rules to live by, really is transformative in each area. Wonderful. I, I want to finish on that on such an uplifting note and such an inspiring note and so on of really like tapping into that beauty, that energy, that love that exists instead yes. of being dragged down by the negativity, which we see all around us, but that's not it. We have to look past it and that we're not just stuck in a moment. We are a part of, of, of an infinite okay. amount of moments and infinity and so on. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rabbi Jeffrey Katz. Your book again is Rules to Live by Maimonides, Guide to a Wonderful Life, a wonderful podcast wonderful discussion here thank you so much for being on a rash's world it was terrific thank you so much god bless